Tanzanian leader Tundu Lisu arrived in Tanzania today to a warm welcome by supporters at the Julius Nerere International Airport before making his way to address a rally in commercial capital Dar es Salaam. Lisu, who is the vice chairman of the Chadema opposition political party, has been a fierce critic of the government. In 2017, he was shot 16 times by unknown gunmen who left him for dead. VOA's Esther Gitu Award spoke with Lisu via Skype before he boarded an airplane from Belgium where he had lived in exile. Lisu said he is pleased with Tanzania's President Samia Suluhu's lifting of a ban to allow opposition politicians to gather and engage in politics. He said he will push for constitutional reforms to allow democracy in Tanzania to thrive. Well, uh, President Samia's recent lifting of the illegal ban on political activity for the opposition means that we in the political opposition can now do what the law has always allowed us to do, and that is carry out political rallies, meetings, demonstrations in accordance with Tanzanian law. What the president did was actually to lift an illegal ban. We have, we cannot, we cannot, we must underline that. Take us back uh, to your own personal story, your personal political tribulations that had you maimed and perhaps left for dead, and how you moved on from there. Well, as, as you may remember, on September 7th of 2017, in the afternoon, I was attacked outside my uh, parliamentary apartment in Dodoma, Tanzania, by people who have never been identified to date. And I was hit 16 times and left for, for, for dead, as you, as, you, as you put it. Uh, but uh, God is great. I was rushed to hospital, and thereafter I was rushed to Kenya where I was in hospital for four months, and eventually I came to Belgium where I spent 11 months in hospital and 24, 25 surgeries in, in total. Now, talk to us about how your life has been, I would say, in exile in Belgium. I woke up one fine morning, went to my office. I never returned home, and uh, I have not been able to return home ever since that that fateful day uh, with the exception of the the three months that i spent campaigning for the presidency in 2020 these have been some of the most difficult periods of my of my life um, separated from my family separated from the people i love separated from my the country that i have loved that i call home uh, that i you know i i i vowed to 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 serve. So, so these five years have been very, very difficult. Are you confident that you can now return to active politics? Well, I, I never left political scene. I, I may have been out of the country, but I was never out of the country's politics. Uh, as you may remember, I returned in 2020 to face uh, John Pombe Magufuli in the presidential race. Um, uh, and what happened, happened but uh, I never left politics. So what were your reflections when you saw uh, the Tanzanian opposition political parties meeting this past Saturday? Uh, I, I must say I was not entirely surprised uh, by the, the high turnout. I wasn't entirely surprised by the massive um, and emotional uh, uh, you know, reconnection with the people and their leaders. Mr. Lisu, if you do get a chance for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with President Samia Suluhu Hassan, what will your discussions be like? I will tell her exactly what I told her on the 17th of February last year when I met her in Brussels, that the country needs a new constitution, a new democratic and a constitution that will create and a, a government accountable to the people and to representative institutions of the people. We need freedom, 
justice and people-centered development. That was Tanzanian opposition leader Tundu Lisu. He spoke via Skype with my colleague Esther Gitu Award yesterday before he arrived in Tanzania. For more on Lisu's return to his country, check out voaafrica.com. A new report on African governance says Africa is less safe and democratic than 10 years ago. The study by the Mo Ibrahim Foundation attributes that to over 23 successful and attempted coups since 2012. Eight have been successful, including two each in Mali and Burkina Faso, both which are also fighting an Islamic insurgency. The report also says that nearly 70% of all Africans and more than 30 countries saw a decline in security and rule of law, including South Sudan, Sudan, Somalia, Eritrea, Cameroon, Central African Republic, and Burundi. Many of the nations in the index have introduced emergency measures and a clampdown on civil society. The report notes that African nations are influenced by the global growth of authoritarianism in countries such as Turkey, China, Russia, and Hungary. Mo Ibrahim, a British billionaire born in Sudan, committed to democracy, said Africa is not responsible for some of the issues exacerbated its governance issues, like climate change or food shortages from the war in Ukraine. But he said the continent is responsible for bad governance. The index does not does note improvements in some areas, including economic growth, improved infrastructure, education, and gender equity. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. U.S. Secretary Janet Yellen is in South Africa on a three-day visit. The trip is part of the promise President Joe Biden made at the U.S. African Leaders Summit in Washington, D.C. last month, where he pledged to deepen ties with Africa. In Johannesburg, reporter Tuso Kumalo has been following Secretary Yellen's visit, and a few hours ago he spoke with me to update us on developments. Welcome. Thank you so much. So, what's the latest you have for us regarding the U.S. Treasury Secretary's visit? Today, on day two, she visited uh, uh, the Dino King uh, Game Reserve, just 60 uh, kilometers out of Pretoria, the north of Pretoria, the capital of South Africa. And uh, she, she went around, and uh, it gave a feel of how to see these wildlife animals in their natural habitat. And after that, she briefed the media. And uh, in, the meeting, in the meeting with the media, she emphasized that uh, the U.S. is committed in fighting wildlife uh, trafficking as well as uh, poaching. You know South Africa is experiencing quite a lot of uh, poaching, especially with the rhino poaching. And she, she's saying uh, together with South Africa, they formed a task force uh, that is going to be looking into sharing information about uh, uh, the, the poachers and the traffickers of, of wildlife, as well as uh, uh, tracking the finances really uh, that are coming out of that and fueling uh, this illegal industry. Of, of course, also she said uh, this entity is going to help also in strengthening uh, the mechanisms within the countries so that uh, uh, poaching is, uh, is stopped even before it happened. So uh, today it was a uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, giving a hand to South Africa to say uh, this is what we can do in terms of fighting poaching, not only in South Africa, but globally as well. So she has she met any South African official? After that meeting, she is scheduled to meet uh, President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, but uh, this is a closed meeting. The media uh, not allowed there, but we know the issues uh, that are there, uh, the issues of uh, strengthening economic relations, expanding trade, which is very, very key at the moment uh, for South Africa. Uh, the indication earlier was uh, in, in her artillery, it wasn't in the program that she's going to meet Ramaphosa, but today getting confirmation that uh, uh, that meeting will take place so that at least the Ramaphosa and those in South Africa stands and the welcoming hand to U.S. plans to invest and expand trade in South Africa. Uh, South Africa's closeness uh, with Russia, especially regarding the uh, Ukraine crisis, uh, do you think, uh, can we anticipate a major change in U.S. trade policy for South Africa? 
currently that's unlikely because what we saw is that after the Russian minister visited here, uh, so the South African government, the minister of uh, foreign affairs in South Africa was full of praise of their relations, the discussions, even rejecting uh, questions, uh, questioning that was saying, why is South Africa hosting uh, military drills for, for Russia and China saying uh, no one should tell South Africa what to do. South Africa is a sovereign state and has to do things according to what it thinks. So both of them have been very much welcome. Uh, uh, Secretary Yellen welcome in all the areas that she's going and has indicated the meeting uh, with the President Ramaphosa and of course the, 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 the Russian ambassador also, the Russian minister also very much welcome. So it seems South Africa uh, is, is treating them as, as people that are coming to invest and for it that's enough, not getting into the politics and differences between the U.S. and Russia on the issue in Ukraine. To Sokumalo from Johannesburg, closely monitoring Secretary Yellen's visit to South Africa. Uh, thank you for your input, Tuso. Thanks so much. Some foreign policy analysts say U.S. plans to designate a Russian private military company, the Wagner Group, as a transitional criminal or as a transnational criminal organization could be a signal to countries, especially in Africa, to backpedal on their engagements with the mercenaries. The move also could hamper the Kremlin war on Ukraine. White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said the sanctions that go with designating the Wagner Group as a criminal entity will squeeze its ability to do business around the world. The group has a presence in Libya, the Central African Republic, Sudan, Mali and Syria with documented reports of human rights abuses and lootings. Atlantic Council analyst Michael Shorkin, also with a 14th North Strategies, told VOA that it is unclear what impact this designation would have. VOA's Ignatius Anor spoke with Shorkin about how the sanctions could affect its operations in Russia's war on Ukraine and in other countries. So to be honest, it's not clear what impact this has on the Wagner Group itself. Um, I mean, we'd like to think that sanctions have lots of effects, and they tend not to. Uh, they tend to have less of an effect than we would like. Uh, hopefully, at the very least, it sets a message saying that this is what we think of the Wagner Group, and hopefully also this might encourage countries, perhaps in Africa, to think twice of engaging Wagner services because that this could risk getting them in trouble with the United States government. I wouldn't say that what the U.S. is doing now is it in any way sufficient, but at least it's necessary and just something that has to be done. I mean, yeah, maybe this should have been done a year ago, probably, or several years ago, but, but here we are, so we're doing it now. Wagner is heavily involved in Ukraine, helping Russia soldiers on the front line, however. The clan Galvin of Nairobi-based risk advisory company WS Insight told Ignatius Anor the designation by the U.S. is a strong alert for anybody who engages the services of the Wagner Group. It certainly is justified. Um, what's unfortunate is it's taken uh, as long as it has for some more robust action um, to kind of both designate and then and then enhance sanctions on not just uh, the Wagner Group, but it's, of course, it's financiers and, and then um, to, to punish or penalize anybody who, who, who tries to facilitate that, that organization. What it does mean is, at least with these sanctions, that anybody who, who tries to dabble or interact with, with the Wagner Group uh, faces kind of more penalties and, 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 and uh, kind of uh, repercussions. Um, and so 